Hi, it's Lindley Oz, and welcome to another episode of Truth Hunters, because then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And especially here in these dark hours where we are seeing prophecy unfold at a fast pace, it is more important than ever to know the truth of God's Word and to know that we have a repentant heart and we are walking in the ways of Jesus Christ. So that's what this show is all about, finding the truth. What is the truth? There are so many lies and so many heretical teachings that many of us cannot decipher what is the truth exactly. Where are we being lied to? There's so much deception. So I hope that you will join me tonight by the fire pit. Grab your coffee, your tea, your water, whatever it is you like to drink when you sit and watch these videos. But whatever you do, I hope that you will stick around and join me for the entirety of this show because we're going to get into some deep Bible study and some scriptures because, hey, after all, we want to know the truth. We do not want to be deceived. Jesus warned us over and over and over again of deception in these end times. So we do not want to be deceived. So it's really important that we search the scriptures and find out exactly what the Bible has to say, not what pastor so-and-so says and not what this person says or that person says or what your mother told you or your dad or your uncle or your aunt or your grandparents, but what God's Word actually has to say. So join me. We're going to get started here in just a moment. God bless all of you and let's find the truth together. So I can't really get the fire going just yet because it is still way too hot. They had heat warnings out today. And of course I have somebody down the street using lawn equipment, lots of trucks, motorcycles, and loud vehicles going past. I'm actually quite a distance from the street, but these vehicles are loud. So responses to the last video, I had one individual who put in the comments that they were very concerned for me. They felt that I was being very mean and not delivering things in a spirit of love. I had some claiming the verse, there is therefore now no condemnation, but they don't pay attention to the whole verse. The verse says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus and walk according to his purpose. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. Something to think about. The key words there are for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. If we are living in sin and unrepentance, we are not in Christ Jesus, my friends. And people want to get mad at me and say I'm being unloving because I'm telling you the truth. No, to lie is being unloving. To tell you the truth is being loving because we tell the truth at all times. We don't sugarcoat it or water it down. I don't know if this person was wanting me to sugarcoat the truth or they just didn't want to hear the truth. I have found, however, that most people who get deeply offended when you tell the truth to them, it is because they do not want to repent. You see, repentance is a very unacceptable message to a lot of people because it touches their idols and their things that they put before God and their sin. And there's things that people want to do that many churches are teaching are perfectly normal, like yoga in the church, which is a total new age occult thing to begin with. You can't turn it into something Christian. Yoga is not Christian. The only thing the word says meditate on the word. That's talking about deeply ponder the scriptures, speak them aloud to yourself, study them, think on them. Okay. Doing yoga positions is opening portals to demonic forces in your life. You can take a pig and you can put lipstick and jewelry on it and stamp the word Christian on its butt, but that pig is still a pig no matter what you do with it. So the same is true when we talk about bringing in the occult into Christianity. The Bible talks about that. It talks about bringing Baal worship into the house of God. 
and we can't bring Baal worship into the house of God. Okay, so a lot of people who get offended over the truth, it's because number one, they're under a spirit of deception. They're brainwashed. They've been taught these lies for so long that you tell them the truth, but their mind is still rehearsing the lie over and over and over like a hiccup to where even though they're hearing the truth, their brain just cannot even begin to perceive it. And although it can make someone angry and be irritating to have to deal with that, we do have to pray for those people. They are only being the way that they're being because they are deceived. In fact, we're going to talk about some scriptures tonight I have where the Bible warns us that there would come a day where people would kill other people and believe that they're doing it for God, that they're glorifying God and doing so. And that goes back to that NAR stuff that I've been talking about. I know that many of you probably think at this point I'm harping on it, but Jesus harped on it. Jesus harped over and over on deception. And so because we are in that time, it's very important for me to keep hitting on that and brushing on it. I know some of you who are not deceived, you probably get tired of hearing about it, but my friends, there are many people who are gonna see these videos who don't know about it, who haven't heard me say that before, who are very deceived. So please be patient with me. We're not just going to talk about that. I am going to mention stuff like that in this message, but I believe there's those of you who are like, okay, Lynn, I understand. I get it. Let's move on to something else. We will be talking about other things, but I will brush on that. But there are people who are deceived by this and these NAR people, they even pray for God to go and kill people who are sinners. And I revealed that in my video titled False Prophet, my documentary that I keep telling you all to go and watch. Even if you're familiar with the NAR and this dominionist movement, you still would benefit by going and watching that because there's a lot of information in it. I had someone else comment thinking that I was saying all evangelicals are a cult. Okay, I am specifically talking about the evangelical NAR, apostate dominionist movement. I'm sure there are evangelicals out there who are not part of that movement. I just want to be clear on that. So if you go watch that video I just told you about, you're going to be more educated on what defines this NAR movement, this dominionist movement, who is part of that. Because the Lord revealed to me who they are, and you will find out if you watch that video. So we're going to get into some good discussions here today in this video. And I believe you're all going to be very blessed. So here soon we'll start the fire. The temperature has dropped probably a half a degree. So hopefully it won't be too much longer. We can get the fire going. I can pour my coffee, which I don't have any coffee in here. So I can pour my coffee in my camping bush crafty cup and then we can get her going get it started we can pour the gasoline in that mower and let her ride so stick around with me we're going to get started here in just a moment so i guess while we're waiting to get the fire going let's go ahead and go over some scriptures i printed up on repentance yes i know everybody's favorite subject second chronicles seven fourteen. if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now notice he's addressing his people who are called by his name. He's not talking to the world. He's not talking to the lost. He's specifically talking to his people. If they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So how does God forgive our sin? When we pray, seek his face, humble ourselves, and repent, turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to confess our sins to the Father. 
When we pray, we confess them before him, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Many of us think that, well, God already knows what my sins are, so I don't need to confess them, and well, just forgive me of all my sins, Lord. Well, it's very important. Now, understandably so, we all don't necessarily remember every sin we have committed. So you can still pray that way. That's okay. But there shouldn't be so many in one day's time that you can't remember what your sins were. Because overall, we're supposed to live our lives righteously and in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but we're supposed to confess our sins to him. And he's faithful and just or fair to forgive us of our sins. And not only to forgive us of all of our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Acts 3.19 Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from from the presence of the Lord. In our day and age, many of us don't really have the full understanding of what it really means to serve Jesus Christ. You see, throughout the ages and throughout time, things have been watered down, things have been lost in translation, things have been forgotten, history has happened, customs have changed. And so, as we have it today, many really don't understand what it means to truly serve the Lord. The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, forever. God doesn't change. Many of us tend to have this mindset that because we've changed, that God is going to accept many of our sins in this day and age, as opposed to the acceptance of sins that he showed back in that day and age. And that is just not true. God is the same. The Bible tells us that. We have a lot of preachers and teachers who have just taken scriptures out of context and slanted them to make them sound the way that they want to sound in order to tickle the ears of the people. Because believe it or not, when you deliver messages that are not popular to the people, one of the reasons they do this is they want popularity, but a lot of times people won't give. They get mad and then they won't give. So these pastors and stuff like that, they don't want to make their congregation angry and have people leave and then be out money. So they begin to conform their messages to be messages that just inspire or motivate the people. In fact, many pastors today are more motivational speakers than they are true teachers or true disciples or true ministers of the truth of God's word. They have become motivational speakers, uh, comedians. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being humorous or personable in your presentation or for trying to inspire people, but they're not preaching the truth when they do it because they know that people don't want to hear it. And many of these people teaching these fallacies and lies believe it for themselves. Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper. Now in this passage here, covers means hides, okay, or covers up to conceal. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. That pretty much speaks for itself. Matthew 3, 8, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Now, that comes up in some passages I'm going to read to you from Jesus' own words here in just a little bit. Matthew 9, 13, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay, Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus himself said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. James 4, 8, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
So this is what I'm running into a lot here on YouTube as I present these videos. I'm running into people who are double-minded. They want to believe that they can still walk and live according to the flesh and they can just tell God they're sorry every night before they go to bed and wake up the next day and do it all over again. Tell God they're sorry before bed and so on and so forth. And that is just not true. That is being double-minded. That is not really following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Very dangerous. One person threw up at me the unpardonable sin is the only sin that you go to hell for. Okay, that is really misquoting that passage. I'm talking about sins that you can repent for, but unfortunately, if we don't truly repent and turn away from the flesh, and I'm not talking about being perfect. There are some people who believe you have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. The Bible says that if someone says they are without sin, they are a liar. Okay, we all will continue to make mistakes. We're talking about living in sin and unrepentance and not genuinely making an effort from your heart to please the Lord. So there was this person who quoted that scripture at me and I'm talking about sins you can repent for. But if you die in unrepentance and you've walked away from Jesus, Jesus will never walk away from you. Okay, again, I'm going to say that one more time. Jesus will never walk away from you, but you can walk away from him. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm not here to tickle anybody's ears. I'm not here to make friends. I'm not here to be liked or adored. I'm here to glorify God, and that's it. And I will glorify him by presenting the truth. Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Joel 2.13, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. God relents when we repent. That's right. God relents when we repent. I'm purposely adding an S to it so it rhymes. Luke 15, 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Look at that. Repentance is so important to God that it says in Luke 15, 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over just one sinner who repents than over 99 just or righteous persons who need no repentance. Ezekiel 1.32, For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God, therefore turn and live. I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God, therefore turn or repent and live. Turn from your wicked ways. Acts 17.30, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, and boy has he for years now, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Luke 13, 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Proverbs 1 23, turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. All right, Zechariah chapter one, verses one through six. And I think we're going to get the fire started. Okay, we'll get into some conversation here. A call to repentance in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, 
Do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded, my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Then they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts proposed to do to us, in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. And Revelation 21.8, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Did you hear that? It doesn't say except for. Anybody who lies is a liar. Anyone who murders is a murderer. Anyone who does witchcraft or sorcery is a sorcerer. Anyone who commits acts of sexual immorality is sexually immoral. The cowardly, that's those who live in fear. People who live in fear of everything. In other words, they don't trust God. It's okay to fear God. We're supposed to fear God. You know, to have that um, respect for God. Okay, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, so those who live in fear, those who don't believe and have faith in God, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Finally, Revelation 21, 5 through 8. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write. For these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So in that verse, it's a repeat of the one I just shared, except I shared what was before that. So there you have it. Repentance. Some people think it's not necessary. Some people think it's not important. Repentance. Some people say they repent every day. You can't repent every day or that's not repentance. I think what you mean by that, people who say that, is you confess your sins and tell God you're sorry every day. But that's not really repenting. If you're doing the same thing each and every day, and maybe you have something you struggle with, you've taken to the Lord, and you've started the process of repentance. You've admitted to Him you have to have help, and you're doing whatever you can to get help for that, or whatever, that's different. But if you're just willfully doing the same darn thing every single day, day in and day out, that is not repentance. Because people say to me, I have to repent every day. Then you don't even know what repentance means. Repentance means a change of heart, a change of mind. Turn away. It doesn't mean you will be perfect. You may struggle with something in particular. And from time to time you slip and fall. We make mistakes almost every day and do something. Many of us do. Some of us more than others. For those of us who are babies in Christ, you know, God understands you're a baby in Christ and he will nurture you and he will give you the milk and honey to get you going. All right. But for those of us who have been with the Lord for quite some time and we are mature enough in him, God expects us to understand. God expects more from us because we've been with him for so long. We have known him for so long. And if you're truly repenting, you shouldn't have to be repenting every day. Yeah, we have the little silly stuff we struggle with. You know, like maybe you accidentally slipped a cuss word or you accidentally started to get mad about something, okay? But there are some things that some of us are really in bondage to. And if you're doing it every single solitary day, that's not repentance. I just want to tell you the truth about that. So now it's time to get the fire started and get the lanterns on because it's starting to get a little bit darker here. So God bless you. We'll be back in just a moment and we'll get down to the messages. And thank you for listening while I went over the verses on repentance. I may be calling some more of these up during our discussion. I don't know, so I'll save my list here. But stick around. We're going to get into the discussion. I'm going to light the fire. God bless you. 
So now I've got the fire going. I don't have all the lanterns on yet because it's not super, super dark. I have a gas lantern right down here on the ground at the left, but I don't want to waste the gas. So many sisters and brothers who are speaking the truth are just getting so attacked. I'm telling you, under so much attack. But that is the persecution or part of the persecution that us who speak the truth go through, unfortunately. Jesus said himself that the world will hate you. They hated him first. A slave is not greater than their master. And so that's just par for the course when you speak the truth. The devil doesn't want people to receive the truth or to know the truth. He wants them to live in darkness. He loves it when these preachers and ministers come out and teachers and they distort the truth and they brainwash the people to believe a pack of lies. And you can tell because it's the acceptable message. It's the one that tickles the ears. It's the one that pleases the flesh because, well, it's the easier way. The Bible, however, makes it perfectly clear that to follow in the footsteps of Jesus means suffering and it means giving things up, sacrifice. After all, didn't Jesus make the ultimate sacrifice for us? He sure did. So what does it mean to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Does it mean just to be a good person and to do the good things? that we ought to do as Christians. Well, that's part of it. But following in the footsteps of Jesus means that we will suffer. We are called to suffer as Christians. If you don't believe me, it's all throughout the New Testament about suffering and being called to suffer. And many of us have been taught that as Christians, we have it easy. Everything's supposed to be wonderful. Name it and claim it, the health and wealth and prosperity gospel. And that is so far from the truth. People come at me and say that I'm going to turn people away from being Christians by telling them the truth. But I say to you, no, the people who have been lied to are the ones who will turn away. And the reason they will turn away is because they have been told a ton of lies, told that they will be blessed beyond blessed with joy and they will have whatever they want and all this other stuff. And then the moment suffering comes their way, they begin to think they've done something wrong or they doubt God even exists and they give up. Those are the ones who turn away from the truth. But when you go into the commitment of being a servant of Jesus Christ and you know the truth and you understand that you're going to be separate from the world and you're going to be rejected by the world and you are going to suffer because you're going to undergo demonic attacks and all sorts of hell because you represent Jesus Christ on this earth, the devil's domain for right now, until Jesus comes back, and you understand that, then you don't expect all these other things and you don't doubt, doubt God. In fact, you end up studying the scriptures more in depth and learning how to get through the suffering. How can you have joy in your heart? How can you have hope and faith during the suffering? But you see these name it and claim it, prosperity teachings, teach you things that are not true at all and then so people end up turning away so these people that say you're going to turn people away for telling them this stuff you're turning other people away you're turning people away from the faith don't tell me that did Jesus tell us we're supposed to sugarcoat or water down the truth and lie to people no he didn't that is a lie what turns people away from the faith is those who got into the faith believing lies and because of those lies, they ended up giving up, feeling like God doesn't exist, or feeling like God isn't really there for them, or they've made God mad, or they've done something wrong. So the truth is what people need to hear. And then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Fire's going very nice. You know, Having a controlled fire is fun, but whew, it's a different story when it's an out of control fire that you didn't plan on or you didn't intentionally make, or if you end up rejecting the gift that was freely given to you by Jesus Christ and you choose to live in unrepentance and sin 
and you choose to reject him over and over and over and over and over again. And then you end up following the temptations and the lies of the enemy Satan straight to hell. God doesn't send people to hell. We send ourselves there because we are given a choice. And when we don't make the choice to follow Jesus Christ and to believe on the truth, we are the ones responsible for following the deceiver, the father of lies, straight to hell. So there's been some news. Stephen Bendenoon put out some news about all of this stuff that's taking place is actually to cover up what's really coming and he is saying that there is an asteroid that is headed our way in september late august early september something like that and he said it has been confirmed and so they believe it's going to make an impact here and kill a whole lot of people and as a result this whole covid stuff as well as all of this rioting that's taking place is all a distraction and to keep us at home because they don't want just a mass hysteria and panic out on the streets. So I believe it. The Bible talks about something like a mountain being thrown into the sea. Something, however, I did notice People are telling people, if you live in this state or if you live in that spot, run, go somewhere else. Okay, let me just give my thoughts on that. God knows that not everybody can run. I mean, you've got single parents who have custody. One parent has custody of the kids. The other one doesn't. You've got people who are disabled. You've got people who are very poor and whatnot who can't just up and leave and go run and hide somewhere. I mean, you can't, they just can't do that. It's not feasible. So I don't believe necessarily we should all run. Here's what the Lord has laid on my heart about that and I'll share it with you. If you have faith in God and in Jesus Christ and you are really hidden in Him and you're walking with Him and you trust Him and you love Him and it is not your time to go he will supernaturally protect you. I don't care if an asteroid lands in your backyard. Okay, he will elevate your house and let it float through the city. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? If need be, I'm trying to make my point, to protect you. If it's not your time, you're not going to go. He will protect you. If it is your time, you can run all you want and nothing is going to help you. Now, I'm not trying in any way to speak against the people that are saying to do that or to discredit them or anything like that at all. I'm just sharing my thoughts from what I feel the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart about that. So if you happen to be watching this and you're one of those people, I am in no way discrediting you, putting you down, coming against you. Maybe that's what God has laid on your heart to say or that's what you feel he has laid on your heart. However, I don't think it's feasible for everybody just to pack it up and run and hide and people either don't have somewhere to go, they don't know anybody, they don't have the money, they're not in a situation to do that. And God is not ignorant or stupid. God knows everyone's situation. And I just believe personally with everything I have inside that if it is not your time to go, God is going to protect you and you're going to be just fine. That's what I believe. There were times in the Bible God told people to flee. Like God told Lot and his wife to flee and they ran. And he told them don't look back. But Lot's wife looked back. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. Unless God has given you a way of escape. And he has specifically told you to flee. Okay. Just trust the Lord and stay where you are. And trust him to protect you. Walk around your house outside and pray and make sure that you have a repentant heart. Walk all around your property and pray and give God thanks. I don't care if you live in an apartment complex and there's slews of people everywhere that are going to see you. Who cares? The Bible tells us that if we're ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of us. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed. Let people see you do it. You're actually making a statement. 
Walk all around your property. Claim it for the Lord. Speak protection and trust in Him. And if God is telling you to go somewhere and He is giving you a way to get to that place and the means to do it, and you're able to do that and it you know, works out for you, then by all means, listen to God. Do what God says. But if you're in a situation where you can't do that, stay where you are at and trust in the Lord. Because I can't see entire states, people in them just fleeing to some place. It just doesn't work that way. There's, there's a lot of people and I have people write to me, what am I supposed to do? I can't do this or I can't do that or I'm a single mother. I have small children or I'm pregnant, you know, whatever. And they're upset and worried and scared to death. Okay, don't be scared. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not be afraid. Don't lean on your own understanding. In your own understanding, you're going to tell yourself every reason why you should be afraid. You're going to tell yourself every reason why you shouldn't trust God. Like, well, I did sin and did this last week and I struggle with this and that, blah, 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 or I don't have this or I don't have that just trust in the Lord. Repent. If you've got a struggle, take it to God. Start the process of repentance. He will really honor that because he will look at your heart. And if your heart is truly convicted for something and you truly struggle with it and you're in bondage to something and it aches you in your heart that you keep doing this thing, God will look at your heart and he will know that your heart is really repentant but you have a struggle in the flesh, right? I feel the need to tell you that. Take it to the Lord and you better be trying to do what you can to let the spirit lead you. Quote scriptures, pray over it. Try to do what you can to get that temptation out of your path that makes you to sin. That's very important. God will honor it when you take the step of repentance. Okay, I just want to be clear on that. That's very important. So do not fear, only fear God. Extreme, deep reverence and respect. Fear God only and Him alone. Okay, do not fear anything else. And if you are truly doing all that you can do in your heart to be right with God and have a real relationship with Him, you're going to be just fine no matter what happens. Whether it is your time to go, you're going to be okay with it. If it's not your time to go, he will supernaturally protect you. You can run a million miles and travel the entire world. And if it is your day and your hour to go, no amount of running that you can possibly do will do anything for you. Different situation altogether, but Jonah, for instance. Jonah was called of God to go deliver a message to Nineveh. And he was so afraid that he ran and hid from God, but God came after him. So even though that was a situation where Jonah was to deliver a message and he was running from God, the basic overall gist of it is the same. We cannot run from God. And if you're running scared and he hasn't told you to do so, then you're not really trusting in him. So just kind of try to remember that and just trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding, but trust in him completely and he will get you through. So first we're going to talk about Mark chapter 1 verses 14 through 15. It says, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Notice Jesus uses the word repent and believe there. Mark chapter 2 verse 14. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Is Jesus saying to you today, follow me, follow me. And you want to follow him, but you don't know how. Well, my friends, the truth has been blocked from our eyes by the enemy Satan. 
And God wants you to know how to follow Jesus. Trust him, obey him, repent, choose to live in obedience and not to live in disobedience. As I've clearly shared with you over and over again throughout various videos that I have done, there is a huge difference between making mistakes and sinning and living in sin and disobedience. Mark 2.17, and hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so I want to give you guys a little example of something that I think might be easier to help you to understand. There's a lot of people who think, as I've told you, that when you get saved, it's okay to just keep sinning and whatever, it's no big deal. And you don't really have to repent. In fact, they don't even know the meaning of what it is to repent. And they use many different scriptures to try to prove their point, taking them out of context. But one of the scriptures that they tend to use is the fact that it's a free gift. Okay, so I'm going to use the example of a car. Someone gifts you a car. You didn't pay for it. In fact, that person was nice enough. Not only did they gift you the car, but usually when you get gifted a car, you still have to pay the taxes. So the person not only gifted you the car, but they paid the taxes for you too for it. All right. Just because that car was a gift for you doesn't give you free reign to just go drive that car recklessly or to not take care of it. If you don't take care of the car, the car is going to break down on you and be a worthless heap of metal, be junk. Okay, so you can't just go do what you want with the car. You have to take care of the car. You have to do regular maintenance and upkeep on the car, you know, get oil changes, have the brakes checked and so on and so forth. Check your fluids and everything like that. And certainly if you went out and drove your car recklessly, you would possibly kill yourself, other people, get a ticket, go to court, get your license yanked. You can't go drunk driving or anything like that. Okay, so there are still things you have to adhere to, even though the car was not only gifted to you, but the taxes were paid. So that's very important. So the car is gifted to you. The taxes are even paid for you on it. So now you have to take care of it. It's your responsibility to take care of it. You have to do regular maintenance and upkeep and you can't go drive recklessly in the car that was gifted to you. So I just wanted to give you a little example on that because it seems like a lot of people always say, well, it's a free gift. I don't have to repent or I repent daily. And that's from people who don't know what repent means, obviously, because you don't repent daily. That's not even true repentance if you're having to do it every day. Okay, now we're going to look at Mark 8, 27 through 38. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priest and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again and he was stating the matter plainly and peter took him aside and began to rebuke him but turning around and seeing his disciples he rebuked peter and said get behind me satan for you are not setting your mind on god's interest but man's and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him 
when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. So right there you have it. First of all, Peter ends up rebuking Jesus for telling them that he's going to suffer. And Jesus says, you've got your mind on the world. You don't have your mind on heavenly things. And he rebukes Peter for saying that. Then he goes on to explain that if anyone wants to come after him, they must deny himself or deny their flesh, take up their cross, in other words, suffer, and follow him. So sacrifice, suffering, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Okay, so if you're just looking at the things of the flesh and you deny Christ and you don't obey the Lord, okay, you are trying to save your flesh. So whoever tries to put his mind on the things of the flesh or save his flesh, they will lose it. Whoever loses his life for the sake of Jesus and for the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? Because this life, my friends, is only very temporary. What does it profit you to gain the whole world that is going to be destroyed and all the sin and all the corruption and this life is just but for a moment, this life here in the flesh, what will it profit you to gain all these things that are going to go to the dust and be destroyed, but to lose your eternity and spend eternity in the lake of fire? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Something to ponder. Again, if you want to go meditate on that in the Lord, that was Mark 8, 27 through 38. Whew! I'm sweating so much, I feel like a pig in heat. I don't know, do pigs sweat when they're in heat? I have no idea. It sounds good. Anyways, I'm telling you, this fire, I had to get in there and restack all the logs because they all fell over flat. So it was very hot. It's like hell's fire near the fire pit. Very, very hot. I already look pretty shiny from the glow of the fire, but if I look extra shiny, it's because it is extremely humid and hot. So moving on along to the next passage. Let's see. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name, as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. A big word. See, Jesus is trying to show us how serious sin is. So serious that it would be better for you to cut off your foot or cut off your hand or pluck out your eye and go without those parts of your body in this life than it would be to go to hell and burn forever. So Jesus is addressing the importance of repentance and the importance of walking with him. So I think Jesus was pretty clear in that passage, so I don't think I really need to do a whole lot of explaining on it other than to just point out, sin is so serious that Jesus 
says it would be better for us to cut off our hand, cut off our foot, or pluck our eye out. Now, I don't know that he's really suggesting that we go do that if we sin. He's trying to make a point of the seriousness of sin in that it can send you straight to hell. And notice Jesus is talking to John. He's talking to his disciples. He's not talking to unsaved people. He's not talking to the world. He is talking to his people. Okay, that's very important. So Jesus is telling those who are already walking with him. Sometimes we read the Bible and we forget to pay attention to those little things. So he's speaking to his own people. It would be better for you to pluck this part of your body off, pluck your eye out, chop your hand off, whatever, than it would be to keep sinning and go straight to hell where the worm never dies. Something to really think about. All right, Mark eleven fifteen through 26. Jesus drives money changers from the temple. A lot of people like to use this passage to defend that we're just supposed to go out and start shooting people up and making violence and it's okay to do that because after all Jesus got violently angry but that is not so let me just tell you what I see from this then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves and he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple and he began to teach and say to them is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den? The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When we think of Babylon and the beast system, we think of the world economy, we think of money, the markets, and all that stuff. Okay, notice Jesus wants to keep it separate. Jesus does not want the world beast system combined with the temple of God. He does not want us meddling in the world affairs. He does not want us meddling in the beast system. He wants them to be separate. Notice the money changers and those who were selling were selling at the temple and he drove them out. This one is from Mark. But in one of the other Gospels, it could have been Matthew or Luke or John, I can't remember which, he actually was whipping them. That makes God very, very angry when we meddle in the world beast system and when we combine religion with politics. Let me just say that to you again. It makes God very angry when we meddle in the world beast system, which he has given dominion to Satan and the kingdom of hell over for this time until Jesus returns, when we meddle in the world beast system, we are pouring ourselves and our passions and our heart into something that is going to soon be destroyed and is run by the devil. He doesn't want us to combine those things together. And that is a clear example. And I'm seeing a lot of people do this right now. They're mixing religion with the politics and so on and so forth. Now, there's nothing wrong with talking about what's going on in politics as it relates to Bible prophecy to show people how close we are and that they need to repent. But when you start meddling in the world beast system and mixing the religion with the politics, then you are going against the will of God. Jesus didn't come and meddle in the political system. He didn't go and mess around with Caesar or Rome or anything like that. Jesus went out on the streets, he gathered his disciples, and he witnessed to them the truth. That's what Jesus did. And that's who we're supposed to be like. He is our example. When evening came, they would go out of the city. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. 
Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. So let me just ask you, is whatever that was done to you by somebody worth your eternity? Because this life is only temporary. Because God has made it clear we are to forgive others. Are you perfect? Have you never sinned against God? Have you never sinned against a brother or a sister or anyone on the face of this planet? Are you just perfect? Because let me tell you this, none of us are perfect and all of us have, whether intentionally or inadvertently, hurt someone and we have made mistakes. And I don't care if the person doesn't want forgiveness. Maybe they're still evil as all get out. It does not matter. We are required by God to release that person, whether they're guilty or innocent or they've confessed it to us and asked forgiveness or not. We are required. Jesus didn't ask us to do this. He told us to do it. In fact, he said, if you don't, God will not forgive you. And I've just shared with you all about repentance. When we repent, God forgives us. But if you're harboring unforgiveness toward anyone, including yourself, you had best repent and you had best give it to God and be done with it or else God cannot forgive you. And then you are in danger of hell's fire. So I think many of us have unforgiveness. Sometimes what I do is I go through a list of names in my mind of people. And if I have anything negative associated with that person in my heart, when I think on their name, I just turn it over to God. In fact, rather than harbor any unforgiveness or risk that it would be better for you every day, as many times a day as you can, to say out loud, I forgive you so and so, in Jesus name I release you, I forgive you, in Jesus name, and say it all throughout the day and say their name, maybe you have a list of people, say the whole list, it may be an inconvenience, but what's what's worse, having to be inconvenienced by saying that all day every day till it gets into your heart, or to be in danger of hell's fire, I think all of us know the answer to that question. John chapter 15, Jesus is the vine, followers are branches. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. So Jesus is the vine, God is the vine dresser, and those of us who belong to him are the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Now there's still more, but go read it for yourself. If you don't believe me and you want to believe the people who are telling you lies, it's right there. He says, if you don't abide in him. Well, how do you abide in something if you never were in it to begin with? Okay, so that means he's talking to people who are saved. You've already been with him. Now you need to stay in him. 
If you do not stay in him and you become unproductive, you will be cast into the fire and burned up. That is what he says. Go study it for yourself. Jesus doesn't lie and he doesn't contradict himself. There's way too many passages in the Bible that are telling us this. Okay, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you that you love one another. All right, let's break there. We are commanded by God and Jesus Christ to love one another. Loving one another is not doing each other in. It is not bashing each other. It is not shaming each other. It is not doing wrong to each other. It is not harboring unforgiveness toward one another. It is not seeking evil to one another. It is not seeking to get even with one another. It is not gossiping and speaking hatred toward one another. There's a lot of gossip. I've had so many lies and rumors spread about me that it's not even funny. I never talk about it because I've always learned that the more fuel you give to something, the more fire you create. So the best way to let a fire go out is to not add fuel to it. So I just don't talk about it. I also don't believe in giving that kind of garbage my time of day. I see a lot of people when they have rumors, they'll do a whole video on it that go around about them. I don't believe in giving the devil any of my time. If rumors go around about me and people want to believe that, they're going to believe it. Okay, the Spirit of the Lord and those with the true Spirit of the Lord will know in their hearts what is true and what is not true. And God will convict those people. But we have to love each other even if somebody wrongs us. I just talked to you about forgiveness. Okay, disciples' relation to the world. And after this, I'm going to break to add some more wood to the fire. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. All right. The world will hate us. So I was discussing earlier about people rejecting us and hating us, and about salvation. When you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, the world will hate you. People will hate you. Even quote unquote Christians will hate you. There is a great divide right now. And by the way, I'm going to be talking about something I found in the birth of Jesus. Okay, very interesting. This very prophetic. But the world is going to hate you. They will not love you. There is the apostates, they will hate you. People from your own household, not just your physical household, but from your own church. In other words, fellow believers will also hate you. Jesus said it. He said that a man's enemies will be those from his own household. And that isn't just talking about our physical household on this earth. It's also talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. But... 
People who have hatred are not true disciples of Jesus Christ, according to what we have read. All right, I have one more passage to read to you. Then we're going to talk a little bit. The video has gotten quite long. So then we'll talk and we'll pray and we'll wrap this up. Let me go ahead and add some more wood to the fire. Okay, so next we're going to read John chapter 16, Jesus' warning. So just pay attention and follow along because we're not going to have time to just go over every point. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcast from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that those NAR Dominionist apostates, and that is in my documentary I did on it, titled The False Prophet Ready to Meet the Dragon or something like that. Anyways, that is in that video. I have it on the screen. They actually pray for the death of judges. They speak to principalities and curse them and rebuke them, which I shared in either the last video or the one before that, I've shared it in several, that we are not to do that. We are forbidden by God from doing that. And that means when we do that, we walk outside of his protection, outside of his will, outside of his covering, and we're gonna get our butts whooped. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, or the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So remember I keep telling you that God gave dominion to Satan and the kingdom of hell over this world system until Jesus returns. That's why you see it as the beast system in the book of Revelation and it gets destroyed and so on and so forth. Right here Jesus tells you in his own words and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Who is the ruler of this world who has been judged? Satan and the kingdom of hell. So you see, we need to remember that the Bible tells us that our citizenship is not of this world. This is not our home. Our home is heaven with Jesus Christ and with God. That is where our home is. This world is not our home. Am I telling people that we don't fight? Of course we fight. But we fight the way the Bible tells us to fight. We don't fight in the flesh. If you fight with the flesh, you're wasting your time and you are outside of God's will. The Bible tells us that our weapons are not of the flesh. They are not carnal, but mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. If you want to argue me, go read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Go look at what Jesus did. Go look at what Jesus said. Study Jesus because that's who we are supposed to mirror is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not go around fighting things in the flesh. He went and witnessed. He preached the truth. He preached faith. He preached repentance. So the ruler of this world has been judged. Verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Now let's pause there for just a second. 
So the Holy Spirit will come and he will lead us and guide us into truth and he will direct our paths. If you're not hearing the truth and you're living in an apostate state of mind, meaning one who has known the truth and you've rejected it, that is very dangerous. You are not hearing from the Holy Spirit. You're hearing from demons and devils and lying spirits. If you're not hearing the truth of the words of Jesus Christ and you need to repent Repent as soon as you can and get out of that and come clean because we are in the end, folks. You can see it everywhere. There is no doubt. It does not take a genius to see that we are in the end of the end of the end. It is time to repent and get right. Quit listening to these apostates. Oh my gosh, I hear people listening to Lance Wall now major apostate. Am I saying somebody's name? Yes, I am. I actually wrote to him before I did my documentary and did what you're supposed to do and he ignored me. So Lance Wall now, all those NAR people, the apostates, Paula White Kane, um, the focus on the family guy, all of those people and many more apostates. They are not speaking the truth. They do have a leader. His name is uh, Shay on, I don't know how to pronounce it, C-H-E-A-H-N. From what I understand, and I don't know details, but they were actually a few weeks ago, they either did it or were advertising for it, calling fire from heaven, and they had some staff like Moses. Come on, what does the Bible say the false prophet does? Calls fire from heaven and does signs and wonders. You guys, it can't be more obvious or more clear the times in which we're living. So now let's move along. We're going to move along down to verse 16. A little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he is telling us? A little while and you'll not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the father. So they were saying, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And so he said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. So Jesus is telling us right there, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. So the world will be rejoicing, but you will be suffering, grieving and lamenting, but your grief will be turned into joy. Just like a woman in labor, she's in intense, serious pain to give birth to this baby. But as soon as she sees that precious little baby and holds it in her arms, all of a sudden she forgets the excruciating pain and torment that she went through and the suffering. So Jesus is telling us himself that we will have suffering if we walk in him and we walk according to his ways we will indeed have suffering on this earth so that is the truth i mean you can't get more clear than the very words of jesus christ himself there are so many deceptions and i know i'm going to get those same people that come to the video and leave the comments saying there is no condemnation well, there isn't. If you're in Christ Jesus, that's what the verse says. Start reading it. Start paying attention to what you're reading. Isn't your eternity and the eternity of your own family and your loved ones and your friends, isn't it important to you? Do you want to take a chance on spending your eternity in hell? I tell you the truth. The people that end up walking away in frustration are the ones who have believed a lie and then when things didn't work out the way they thought it was going to work out because they were lied to, they ended up giving up, losing faith and hope, and walking away. 
The truth of the matter is when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, it is just that it is your heart. We don't get saved out of fear. We don't get saved just because we don't want to go to hell. Sure, that's part of it. We get saved because we genuinely want to follow Jesus Christ. We genuinely want to represent him. We genuinely want to obey him. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, obey me. We genuinely want to be one with him. We long for him. We desire for him. We don't desire for the things of the flesh. See, when you're truly saved and you truly have Jesus, you don't really want to sin. You do sin and make mistakes, but you don't sit around wanting to sin. You want more than anything to obey him and please him. Think of a couple. When a couple first comes together, they go out of their way to do all these things to show off and please the other person. Maybe cook really nice dinners, look their best, be on their best behavior, do all these extra things, go out of their way to do stuff. Now, in many relationships, that fades and people become lazy and they're like, I'm not doing this anymore. And the husband's like, honey, you don't cook me those special dinners anymore like you used to. Am I not special to you anymore? Or the wife is like, honey, you don't give me those sweet love cards that you used to get for me every so often or you used to bring home flowers or you used to clean the house when I was gone at work for me to surprise me. You don't do that anymore. Do you still love me? You see, the passion in many people's relationships after the honeymoon phase is over begins to fade and people become sloppy to where they don't do those special things anymore. It's not supposed to be like that. That's not how God meant for it to be. So same type of situation. Many of us, we get saved and we lose our passion and everything we do for God becomes a task, just like a married couple, it becomes a task. Whereas before you were happy to do it, it wasn't a task. You didn't even notice how wore out you were from doing all these extra things or all the time it took you to do those things. You happily made that meal that you went through a great amount of trouble to make. It was no skin off your back. It was no big deal. But now all of a sudden it's a task. It's a job. It's hard to even find time to do it. And as you're doing it, you're thinking, why do I have to do this for him? He doesn't appreciate me. And why he's doing something for you, he's thinking, why don't she do this herself? You know, that's how many marriages become. And it, like I said, it's not supposed to be that way. Your marriage is supposed to reflect the glory and the beauty of your marriage to Jesus Christ. And so we kind of get this lazy behavior about our relationship with the Lord. We are not supposed to be the slop job housewife or the lazy couch potato husband. We are supposed to continuously shower our mate in love and support them and be a strength to them. In the same sense, Jesus as our husband will support us and love us and be a strength to us. But we have to happily serve him with our whole heart and do those extra things for him to show him how much we love him. Spend extra time with him. Give him a chance to speak when you pray. Don't just be one-sided, you know, the person doing all the talking, but be still and know that God is God. That's how we are supposed to be. So I just want to leave you with that. This video has gotten long. If I have more to say, we will share it in the next video. But for now, I'm just going to leave you with that, reflecting and pondering on how a marriage is supposed to be. And then as you think about how a marriage is supposed to be and go back in time to the very beginning, like I just stated, and think on those things and then ask yourself, have I lost my passion as the bride of Christ? And am I being a slop job housewife? Even if you're a man, are you being sloppy in your relationship with the Lord? Has the passion faded? Well, you need to go to the Lord and repent. And you need to ask him to bring that passion back. Start filling yourself with the truth of God's word. Start spending extra time in prayer and ask him about it. Have others pray for you about this. 
for that passion to return. You see, most of us are like the church of Ephesus where we were once on fire and we were once so in love and we once had all this passion, but the passion has faded and now we're just going through the motions of our salvation. And it can't be like that. If it's like that, you will fail at every turn. You will not succeed in your walk with the Lord. You must learn to fall in love with him. Don't just love him for what he is. Don't just love him because you're afraid of hell. Don't just love him because you want to be healed of something. Love him because you are in love with him and because you have passion for him and because you have desire for him and because you want to make him happy. The verse in the Bible that says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. We think that that verse and somebody wrote me and told me this last year and thank you for sharing this with me. We read that verse wrong. We look at it as our joy in the Lord is our strength. That verse is actually saying when we are strong in the Lord, he is full of joy. That makes him happy. So when we are strong in the Lord and we stand our ground and we obey him, it pleases God and makes him happy. So the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. My strength makes God very happy. My strength and my obedience and my commitment to him and my passion and my desire and my yearning for the Lord my God makes him so happy. Doesn't it make you happy if you're a spouse out there listening or maybe you were married once and your marriage just was totally destroyed because you guys lost the passion. Somebody went out and cheated or there just was no love anymore in the home and there was constant bickering. Think about what you wanted. More than anything, you wanted to feel loved. You wanted to feel needed. You wanted to feel protected. You wanted to feel honored. You wanted to feel respected. You wanted to feel like you were number one. Well, God is a jealous God. And God wants to feel all those things from us. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. If we're doing our part to let God know that he is number one in our life, he will do his part to let you know, hey, you're number one in mine. You're the apple of my eye. God is awesome. God is good. You know, so many of us make it so much harder than it is. God just wants our love, our affection, our obedience, our trust, our attention. He wants us to lean on him. He wants to be needed. We get into that fleshly state of mind where we're like, I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to do this myself. And every time we keep trying to fix it and do it ourselves, it ends up being a huge failure. The only time you will have true success is when you give it to God and when you lean on him and let him help you do it. We have to take the first step and have faith. And there's sometimes we have to do things to show our faith and we have to take that first step. God can be silent sometimes for many different reasons. One of those reasons can be a time of testing. You're going through a season where you're in a wilderness and he wants you to just really trust in him and lean on him and have faith. He's trying to strengthen you. Sometimes when I hear silence, I take that to mean do nothing when I'm asking him what to do with something. Sometimes there's situations where you have to do something and you've received no answer and you just have to weigh things out and go with what you feel is best. That's called having faith. God is God and there is none like him throughout all the earth. He knows what he's doing. His ways and our ways are nothing alike. And my friends, it's time for us to obey him and put our trust in him. And if there's something in your life that doesn't belong there, you need to just go to God and take it to him. Repent for it. If it's something that really has its claws sunk deep into you and you're just really needing deliverance, take it to him and ask him to help you. At least begin the process of repentance. Don't wait any longer. Go to him today and just renounce this life of sin. 
ask him to help you in the areas in which you struggle and he will and just truly take it to him we may walk away from him as i've clearly stated but he will never walk away from us jesus always stands there with his arms wide open waiting for us to come back he welcomes us to come back to him in fact he welcomes us to turn away from sin to turn away from disobedience and to return to him if you've been committing adultery or idolatry against god it's time for you to go to him today tell him you're sorry confess it to him and ask him to help you and ask him to forgive you there is no greater time than right now to do just that my friends time is so short time is of the essence time time something that we can never get back once it's gone and we are indeed out of time the clock is ticking the clock is ticking each and every day it seems to tick just a little bit faster and a little bit faster not only can time be our friend because God can sometimes give us more time but time can also be our greatest enemy when there's no time left God has given us all plenty of time to commit to him he has given us plenty of time to return unto him and to get our hearts right why wait another day why wait another moment so I just urge you today he loves you so much you out there watching you're, if you're still watching this video you did not come upon this video by accident you came upon this video because God wants you to know that you are special you are loved you are adored he does not will that anyone goes to hell he wants you to be with him but you have to make a serious commitment to him today to belong to him to have Jesus in your heart to be your Savior and to pick up your cross sacrifice and carry it and walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ it can be painful and it means that you will suffer however the end result of not doing that is an eternity of suffering temporary suffering or eternal suffering take your pick as for me and my house I refuse to serve the world and I refuse to serve Satan and I will serve Jesus Christ so as for me and my house we will serve the Lord how about you will you serve the Lord today you and your house if you have others in your home a spouse siblings relatives children whatever or extended family members who do not know Jesus pray for them pray go before the Lord on bended knee and pray for them pray for something great to happen in their life for God to reveal himself in a mighty mighty way and that they would turn their heart toward Jesus Christ and announce him as Lord and Savior and renounce the life of the flesh we can see clearly as I said time is so short time is so short my friends this time this very moment now that you're watching this video is precious as I said you did not come upon this video by accident you came upon this video because God loves you and wants you to be with him God knows that time is short God knows the exact timing of everything that we don't know that's why he speaks to us by giving us that urgency in our spirit and I have that urgency many of us have that urgency as I said we're out of time please won't you consider truly repent today and come to Jesus Christ let's go ahead and pray and before we pray I just want to ask everyone in the live chat because I premiere my videos first to please take a break from typing messages and just respect the Lord I also want to remind everyone to download the free app for my show on Amazon Fire Roku Apple TV and a free app for any Android or Apple device download the free app for the free show today in case something happens here on YouTube and also make sure you check your subscription make sure you're still subscribed to me here on YouTube People are unsubscribed each and every day. I have people that have to resubscribe to me 
several times a week. So check your subscription, make sure you click the little bell so you get the updates. Also, I am viewer supported, so if you feel led or moved to give a gift to the Lonely Oz ministry to help me continue bringing people the truth, I do this full time. It's my full time ministry. I would not have time to do this if I went and worked elsewhere. I work for the Lord. This is what he has called me to do. So if you feel led or moved, you can give a gift via my PayPal or my P.O. box. The information is scrolling across the screen and it is beneath the video in the video description. And God bless all of you who have been giving. I really appreciate it. It is because of you that I'm able to continue bringing these messages to the people. And if you can do nothing else, and even if you can do something else, you guys can all greatly help me. If everybody who watched these videos shared them on social media, you guys would help me so much to fight this censorship. It only takes a second to just click the share, uh, the hyperlinked share button, copy the link and share it on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you're at, Google, Yahoo, share these videos. Help me to fight this censorship. Also, I would like to ask you, if you're not praying already, pray for me, my family, this ministry, pray for our sisters and brothers all over the world, pray for the lost and unrepentant, and pray for our enemies. Also pray for all the government leaders all over the world. I don't care if you're a United States citizen, don't just pray for our president, pray for the leaders of the other nations. The Bible tells us that we are to pray for our leaders. Even if you don't like certain leaders, pray for them all the more. As I said, we don't meddle in the beast system, but we are to pray. Our weapons are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty from God for the pulling down of strongholds. That being said, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, in Jesus name, thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love, your mercy and your grace and the kindness that you have shown to each and every one of us, Lord. We did nothing to deserve it. We are guilty as charged. Yet you have loved us enough to give us time to repent. You have loved us enough to send Jesus Christ, your only begotten son into this world to suffer greatly and to die for us. And then he was raised up three days later so that we could have access to your throne through the Holy Spirit, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for that. We don't take it for granted. We hear about it all the time, but we will not get used to hearing it so that we take it for granted ever. We take it deeply. Lord, we are moved by what you have done for us. We take it seriously and we take our commitment to you seriously today. If we haven't before, we repent for that, Father. We turn away from it. We have changed our mind, changed our will, changed our heart. Lord, we forgive anyone who has sinned against us in Jesus' mighty name. We release it to you. We turn it over to you. We don't hold on to it. We let it go. It doesn't matter. It's not worth it. So, Heavenly Father, we release anyone who has ever done anything against us in Jesus' mighty name. We will not harbor unforgiveness. Lord, we repent to you for losing our passion, for losing faith and hope. We repent to you for disobedience. We repent to you for following any apostate teachings or lies and ask that you deliver us from any demonic strongholds in Jesus' name that have their hands on us. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you that people who are meant to receive this message will receive the truth, the truth of your word, Heavenly Father, and those who do not receive it, Father, that you send messengers to them that would be able to get through, Father, and that they would eventually hear the truth before it's too late and receive it. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. You are God, and there is none like you throughout this entire earth or universe or galaxy, Father. You are all in all. You are everything. You are the first and the last. You are the greatest, Father. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We love you. We adore you. We honor you. We glorify you. We serve you. We happily serve you, Father, with not just part of our heart, not just half of our heart, but with our whole heart. We serve you night and day and you alone because you are God and you have loved us and you have chosen us. 
and we are blessed beyond blessed that you have chosen us father we are blessed beyond blessed that right now instead of being caught up in depression or heaviness or fear or doubt or worry that we will be a light to this world we will shine with joy and happiness and peace and thanksgiving we are a light to this world this is our time to shine to boldly shine before the eyes of the world and let them see that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. All right, God bless all of you. Thank you so much for watching this whole video. I know it was very long, but God bless you. Don't forget to share it. Don't forget to spend more time with the Lord this week not just this week but every week until the very end spend as much time with the lord as you can spend time in prayer spend time in praise and worship spend time in his word spend time in truth let him saturate your mind no matter what you're doing let your mind and your whole entire being be saturated with the spirit of the lord our god through jesus christ thank you so much be abundantly blessed and don't forget that then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.